Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can yes, hear you. Yeah, yeah, great. Yes, okay. sounds good. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I had trouble finding my mic. Okay, uh, thanks very much for asking me to speak uh, in this uh, really interesting series. Uh, I don't do biology as such. I, you know, I work on non-human statin and active matter, which is motivated by biology. I hope that's all right. The other uh, rule breaking I've done is that my two part talk, tutorial and uh, research seminar are on two other two different topics. It's a little bit like giving an to use a Hindustani music analogy, like an alap in one raga and a khayal in another. So you'll have to tolerate that, okay? Uh, anyway, so I'll first, I'll start with the tutorial uh, and I'll you know, introduce the subject and I'll remind you guys as, uh, as your students about linear response at thermal equilibrium, uh, namely the fluctuation dissipation theorem. And then I'll tell you about uh, what happens to it in a class of non-equilibrium systems called active matter, and then I'll summarize. Okay, so I mean, our interest, my interest, a lot of my research interest has been in understanding active particles and act collection, collective behavior of active particles as a problem in statistical mechanics. And the idea of such particles is that each particle is powered, each particle is supplied with energy and has some machinery to turn this energy into movement. And collections of these kinds of particles are called active matter. And we are relatively unambitious so far in the active matter trade information processing is barely beginning to come into the motion of these particles. Anything beyond that you can forget. It's really about the mechanics and statistics of uh, not very clever active particles. And, uh, you know, what we'd like to do eventually is to understand a system uh, like this, or even a completely different kind of system, a 2D quantum system, maybe that you're energizing in the third direction. Both of these in principle are active matter. I won't talk about either of these today. Uh, as you know, active systems are open. They're in a state of sustained energy throughput, and therefore, you know, they are dissipatively non-time reversal invariant. And uh, we'd like to understand their statistical mechanics. But I want to begin with the equilibrium fluctuation dissipation theorem. And the reason is partly that there was a talk a few talks ago in this series where the speaker said that even though they know they shouldn't really be doing it, they're taking a, a living tissue system and using a fluctuation dissipation relation in the form of passive microbiology to extract its viscoelastic properties. Now, in principle, that's not okay. I am absolutely sure the experimentalist concerned had good reasons for doing it in that particular case. But because of that, I thought I'd first tell you how we understand the relation between correlation and response or fluctuations and dissipation in thermal equilibrium. So first equilibrium. Supposing you have a system governed by Hamiltonian, uh, H0, and suppose you take that system and perturb it by a time-dependent field F, which couples to some phase space function Y. Um, let me uh, emphasize at the outset that I'll talk only about a classical dynamical description here. Uh, but you can certainly extend this to quantum systems and see what you get yourself. Uh, if the phase space distribution function is rho uh, of gamma and t, uh, then you can ask, if I put on this, this field coupling to y, what is its effect on either the same or some other phase space function x? Okay, the average of that function x at time t will be given by, its, by taking its expression in terms of phase space coordinates and weighting it with the non-equilibrium uh, phase space distribution function that happens to prevail in the system as a result of this perturbation f i should have said is time dependent uh, and if you want to uh, what we are interested in is the response relation between x and f at in the limit of f going to zero that object is obtained by differentiating the average of x with respect to f uh, and taking f going to zero and that object is called the linear response function and it contains this, it can be re-expressed in this fashion, that the deviation in x average from its equilibrium value is given by a linear operation on the driving force with a kernel, which is the response function. And obviously, uh, it's, you know, it goes minus infinity t because uh, there's no response before uh, the disturbance. Okay. And um, you can work out this function by looking at the time evolution of uh, these averages, 
using the Liouville theorem on the distribution function. So in phase space, no matter what you do, as long as uh, you respect the laws of classical mechanics, uh, Liouville's theorem holds. You can break up the time evolution of rho into a piece from H naught and a piece from F. This object, uh, sorry, this is I've written this badly here. I have missed out the del rho over del t. This pair of objects pertains only to this bit. Apologies for that. Okay. Anyway, you take this, and uh, what you really, all you really need to do is to consider perturbations f, which are instantaneous. F is a delta function because if you do that, then uh, the response will directly give you chi x y of t, right from this interval. So we work that out. So what we do is we work out, we basically have to evaluate this bit. And there are various places where the expressions I write down are correct only to first order in f, which is okay because that's the only part we're interested in. So I haven't always made that clear. <clears throat> uh, also, I'm using a notation in which these square brackets are not commutators, they are Poisson brackets. Okay? So Poisson bracket of y with rho, uh, using a result for a general phase based coordinate c, on the, on the equilibrium distribution function, because rho equilibrium depends only on the Hamiltonian. Uh, d rho over dc is just minus beta rho equilibrium times dc of h, where uh, beta is the inverse temperature. As a result, you can write this Poisson bracket in this form. You can plug this object into uh, the evolution equation for rho and rewrite it in this form because f is a delta function force. And you can therefore relate this object to the unperturbed evolution of the variable y. As a result, you find that the uh, expect the average of x of t is there, which is after all going to be given by the evolution of x of t just based on an initial condition just after the perturbation rho equals t, rho at t equals zero plus, which you can evaluate from here by just integrating forward. And the delta function will give you a little contribution here. So you find that average x of t ends up being this guy. This guy, in turn, by integrating this equation using f being a delta function, ends up giving you just this little contribution. Integral over phase space, rho equilibrium times 1 plus w beta y dot in the absence of perturbation times x of t gamma, where x of t gamma, as I said, is the time evolved x at time t. Uh, which you can rewrite as the equilibrium average of x plus w, which is the strength of the perturbation, inverse temperature, times the correlator of x and y dot. Okay, so just to reiterate that, average x of t can be re-expressed as average x equilibrium plus w b average x of t y dot of zero. So you see that the perturbation x of t minus x equilibrium ends up being just w beta times the correlator of x and y dot. Okay. This object isn't, so this is the fundamental result of linear response theory. Take an external field, couple it to some phase space variable or some phase space function y, and then ask for the effect of that perturbation on some other phase space function x. And the result is that, that response function The linear response function can be related to a property of the system in the absence of the perturbation. The correlation function, which I've written as cxy dot here, the correlation function of x and y dot in the absence of the perturbation. So the power of linear response theory and eventually the fluctuation dissipation relation is that it tells you uh, dynamic response properties of the system when you perturb it in terms of properties of the system when you don't perturb it. Okay, but let's spend a few more minutes um, turning this into a more familiar form, you can use a whole bunch of properties of correlation functions. Oops, I have an A missing here. C A B of T is supposed to be the average of A of T B of zero, which I can rewrite as the average of B of zero A of T, which I can shift. I use time translation variance to write it as B of minus T A of zero, which then becomes C B A of minus T. Okay, I can use that. I can use the fact that the rate of change of C A B, which I can write this way, can be rewritten through elementary manipulations as the correlator of A dot and B, A dot of T B of zero. I can 
take that result and use these, these past two results successively to manipulate the object I started with, namely CX by dot, into the form that I would like. Namely, I can re-express it as a rate of change of CAB. And therefore, for the particular case of two variables x and y, the correlation, the response function of x due to a perturbation on y, displaced in time by time t, is minus the inverse temperature times the rate of change of the equilibrium uh, time-dependent correlation function of x and y with time separation t. Okay, this is the familiar time-domain form of fluctuation dissipation relation. Okay, so chi x y of t is minus beta d over dt c x y. Notice that beta came in purely through the fact that when you differentiate the equilibrium distribution function with respect to any phase space coordinate, the result has the inverse temperature times equilibrium distribution function again. It doesn't matter what ensemble you're working in, the derivative of log of, uh, you know, the derivative of uh, the log of the distribution with respect to the energy is the inverse temperature that's true in micro of narco. Okay, so what we see therefore is uh, that the response function time displaced is minus beta times the correlation function for time greater than zero, and of course zero for times less than zero. A further set of elementary uh, mathematical manipulations, uh, writing these guys in terms of their Fourier transforms, can will show you, and it's a nice exercise for students to do, especially to find the nicest and easiest way to do this. Chi double prime of omega is beta omega over two times c omega. This is often the practical form in which the relation in the classical system is used. You know that in the quantum system, it's not beta omega, it's one minus e to the minus beta h bar omega over h bar, but you can work those things out. This relation is useful because if you imagine what you're looking at is some extension coordinate of some viscoelastic system, you can measure the spontaneous fluctuations of that coordinate, which is viscoelastic dynamics. And from it, you can figure out the viscoelastic modulus. You can figure out the imaginary part, but Kramers and Koenig will tell you how to get the real part. So you can figure out the complete viscoelastic response if you know the correlation function uh, at all frequencies. Remember to use Kramers and Koenig, you need to integrate over all frequencies. So you need to assemble the weight of these correlators over all frequencies. In any case, the point is, it's not just a theorem, it's a great tool for systems at thermal equilibrium. Okay, uh, I assume nobody has any questions at this stage because everybody has done this in graduate school, but feel free to interrupt me if uh, you do have a question. All right, um, so that's fluctuation dissipation at equilibrium. Uh, let's now move uh, to active systems. How am I doing for time? Um, Shriram, you have about 10 minutes. Okay, all right. Uh, 12 minutes to be precise. Okay. That's not too bad. So now, uh, active systems can be viewed in the following way. Now, these are collections of particles, each of which has the ability to consume a chemical and to uh, degrade it and use some of the energy. And let X be a variable measuring how much chemistry has happened. X is the number of fuel molecules consumed. And uh, as a result, of that uh, fuel consumption because of a chemomechanical coupling, an active particle moves or executes some kind of systematic work. That we'll call moving in a spatial direction. So basically, if you want to understand active matter, you just take this object and imagine you have some grooves drawn on some uh, terrain and you tilt the terrain in the chemical direction. That's so you drive the chemical coordinate in one direction. Uh, and the result is because the mobility of this terrain has a non-diagonal bit, you don't just move in the chemical direction, but also in the physical direction, okay? And the typical driving force we talk about is that we maintain a chemical potential difference between reactant and product, and uh, you end up moving spatially. So we worried about this in uh, some detail uh, in the context of writing down Langevin equations for active systems. Uh, and there's a long and partly pedagogical and partly new research paper by my student, Lokar Shri, and my former student now at Paris uh, on which some of what I'm going to say hereafter is uh, based. It's very much in the spirit of the analysis of molecular motor systems that uh, uh, Ilusha Zari Pro did uh, several years ago. Okay, 
So let's see, how do we construct, using this question, how, description, how do we construct equations of motion per active matter? What we do is we imagine you've got a system with uh, some physical coordinates and some other coordinate, which could be chemistry or could be not. And imagine writing down a comprehensive equilibrium type Lajoie equation for the system, which contains, uh, it, formally you can even introduce a momentum conjugate for this chemical coordinate and write down a full dynamics. This is the force. This guy will eventually become delta mu. Imagine that the dynamics of the system has off diagonal uh, kinetic coefficients coupling uh, the uh, uh, so that the damping on each of these variables is determined not only by its velocity, but the other velocity. Okay, let's throw away the inertia of that chemical coordinate and write a reduced set of equations. Let's eliminate the rate of change of the chemical coordinate by in favor of the driving force on the chemical coordinate by taking the chemistry equation and solving for x dot in favor of dxh and uh, the velocity of the physical coordinate you then get a set of equations. So that means here, instead of x dot, I replace it by this guy, this guy, and the noise. Yeah, I have a uh, clarification. Yes, yes. Yeah. Lutra is asking, how can you define uppercase pi, big pi? Uh, so yeah. don't, first of all, even for a chemical coordinate, it's actually the rate at which some effective chemical coordinate is progressing. Uh, but I could instead start directly at this in this form. I don't really need to do that. But in any case, even the chemical reaction involves, you know, it could be an isomerization, it could be something moving. So they'll end up being a variable that actually has to move. So there will in general be some momentum like variable. As, but you can imagine doing this for any, you know, you can do a reduced description starting with any variable. Okay. And so then you get, um, at the moment, this is still equilibrium. Well, I, I haven't yet held the driving force constant. This is the couple dynamics of Q, P, and X. Um, and, uh, you know, it's equilibrium dynamics. The, the transformed noises will satisfy the correct relations with the transformed dampings. Everything will work very, very nicely. Uh, and the, now if you want to turn this into an active system problem, all you do is hold this guy constant. So it means you've taken the chemical terrain and held it at a fixed angle. So there may be little bumps in it, which I'm not resolving, which have to do with the kinetic value of the reactions. But the effective equations of motion for Q and P, if the off-diagonal kinetic coefficient had a dependence on the coordinates of the system, is a dynamics which now has a new term. So there's a term proportional to the chemical driving times, in principle, a new kind of dependence on the coordinates, which can't be derived from an energy function or can't be derived from you can't be invoked in the original problem without a delta mu. So this dynamics, and you have the chemical dynamics on the side if you want it, this dynamics is active matter dynamics. Okay, that's, that's all, that demystifies active matter. Okay, and let's skip ahead to a particular case. Supposing you have, so let me apply this to one particular case. Suppose you have a dimeric particle, a blue head and a red head, which are different in some way. And let X be the central mass coordinate, and let little X be the relative coordinate guys, which is a kind of orientation coordinate of this, this thing, if you're moving in more than one, more than, uh, one dimension. So then you can write down the dynamics, and you can say that in general, if I describe the process I just mentioned, the momentum equation will have a term which depends on delta mu times a relative coordinate. If you hold that relative coordinate, this delta mu fixed, the relative coordinate forces the momentum equation, the central mass momentum. So if you have a dimer in a situation in which you are executing a sustained chemical reaction in one direction, the polar extension of the dimer propels it. Okay, so this is sort of a silly cartoon of self propulsion in this active matter language. And you can take it and you can calculate engine production in this system. One thing to note is this system, if you didn't have a noise on the center of mass coordinate, if you just wrote down these equations without this noise, the only noise was the noise on the relative coordinate. And if the internal, if the relative coordinate was bound in a harmonic, in a quadratic potential, the effective dynamics of this timer uh, can be written down in a form in which you have, um, if the dimer, if the particle is sitting in an external harmonic potential, it actually 
looks like an equilibrium system with inertia. That inertia has nothing to do with the mass. It ultimately comes from the self-propelling character. So you can, in some limits, turn this problem into an equilibrium-like problem. Uh, but let me skip ahead. Let's talk about entropy production. So let's go back to this general class of problems, this pair of equations, and ask for entropy production. Entropy production is defined by the ratio of probabilities of forward and reverse trajectories, which ultimately comes from the ratio of probabilities of realizations of the driving white noise with four and a time reversed version of that. So uh, it's a log of this ratio, which is divided by t and infinite time limit, which is called the entropy production rate. You can calculate it by writing down a dynamic action uh, for this pair of set of stochastic differential equations, which will look uh, like this. I've uh, here gone to the limit where I've thrown away uh, inertia for the central mass coordinate as well. I have a totally inertia less description. I have a functional, on other macro functional for the general problem, depending on whether h is harmonic or not, it's easy or more complicated to deal with. And you can then calculate the entropy production rates. The other point I want to make here is you can imagine asking for the probabilities of the forward and reverse processes with while treating the extension coordinate of this dimer as a coordinate-like variable or deliberately choosing to flip it. So you can ask for forward and reverse ratios with or without polarity flip. And the reason is that the case with polarity flip is what corresponds to this uh, effective inertia description. You do that, you can express the entropy production rates in terms of correlators of central mass velocity and coordinate or driving force and coordinate, depending on whether you do or don't flip polarity. And for the case where all the potentials are quadratic, you can calculate these guys. You can then further, and this brings me back to the theme I started with, you can ask, okay, what I want to know is, on what time scales are the important contributions to entropy production coming? To do that, you take recourse to Harada and Sasa's very nice result, which shows that the entropy production can be written as an integral with just a you know, minor weight involving frequency of the difference between these two quantities. These two quantities would be identical if the system was thermal equilibrium, and the entropy production rate is actually given by integral of omega, omega times this difference. So you can call this of the integrand here, the frequency resolved in production rate. And that guy uh, for my pet dimer is appreciable only at intermediate frequencies. At very high and very low frequencies, it goes to zero. You can do something similar for the polarity flip case. We won't worry about it. So the um, interpretation, Shira, yes, yes. Uh, this is your three minute morning. <laughs> that is great because I'm almost at the end of this part of the talk. Okay. I don't know if you understood anything, but I'm making my time. So. <laughs> What you, uh, why, why do you get the entropy production only at intermediate times? The point is that if you, fill, if you do a very, very coarse filtering of the dynamics, then the fact that the, dime, the driving, uh, you know, the, the, the orientation of the dimer was driving the system, uh, you don't resolve the time correlations of that. The, time, the, the colored noise which would enter the position equation as a result of the, the uh, dynamics, the driving dynamics of the dimer, effectively looks like a white noise. That's why on very low frequencies, you don't see it. At very high frequencies, basically, if you start the system out and let it run, then you haven't sampled for long enough to see the true active steady state. So again, you get this. So this is really interesting. This is what this says. Basically, is that for a problem like this, if you do it, if you filter only looking at very low frequencies, you can get an effective FD relation. Uh, but that can really only tell you about the dynamics of the V very slowest. So that's really all I wanted to say. I don't have a concluding slide. What I have is slides from experiments on looking at that, at uh, Nitin's uh, experiments that that uh, that um, uh, Kim mentioned, where he looks looked at the uh, large deviation function of these of one single self-propelled particle in the heat medium. There's fun physics there. This is just to tell you that these kinds of ideas are accessible to element experiments and even very very simple experiments like vibrating dynamics. So that's all I wanted to say. I'll be happy to take questions on this part of the talk. All right. Thanks, uh, thanks, Sharam, for a really nice talk. So I will start by reading some of the questions that are already in the chat box. And uh, you know, to the audience, please feel free to ask more questions. So I will start with this question by uh, Rudra Biswas. And he asks, uh, if I follow correctly, 
does this imply that we can uh, we can formulate deviation from equilibrium as some kind of generic deviation from Hamilton's equations? I would say generic generic deviation. Well, okay. In principle, after all, if I take a, 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 I mean, I take the whole system uh, and describe its dynamics microeconomically, it is Hamiltonian dynamics. What I have done is introduce damping and noise as well. So I would say it's generic, homogeneously distributed deviation from equilibrium Norsma equations. Whether you choose to include momentum and a Hamiltonian description or an inertia-less description is a purely technical detail. But Sriram, he, Rudra had yeah. a rejoinder. He said that yes. uh, in, instead of equilibrium, he meant non-active. But Yeah, no, that's fine. Non-active. So, yes, uh, that's all active matter really is, yeah. where you energize all the particles in essentially the same way and they carry out energy conversion and move around. So active particles. An active system is just a system in which you suspended energy conservation, but you keep replenishing the energy that the particles uh, use up uh, by, by more. You keep the fuel tank full. That's all it is. All right. Thank you, Shriram. Then there is a question from Raphael, and he asks, uh, he says, thanks for an interesting tutorial. What are the limitations of using the Langevin equation uh, used in your derivations for describing active matter? Um, several, I guess. One is that, in effect, in all these treatments, uh, you build the equations of motion uh, in a flux and force linear relation. So you could certainly worry about that. Second is, if you have a very general active system, like a vibrated layer of particles where it's mechanical agitation, you know, so there you don't even know what the bath is. This treatment is reasonably well posed for systems in which the bath is thermal and you're supplying energy uh, uh, from the outside to an intrinsically thermal system. Uh, in all likelihood, in living systems, you're operating well outside the regime of uh, linear universal thermodynamics. It doesn't seem to affect anything very gravely in the sense that it's rather rare that you get, I, I, have no, I know of no examples offhand where a term that was ruled out, that, that uh, was ruled out by linear irreversible, you know, let's say an active term in the equations wasn't detected already at the level of uh, linear irreversible fundamentals. All right, so I actually have a question. So uh, in terms of the fluctuation spectrum of these active systems, I was wondering if, let's say, you knew the chemical potential in different active systems, can you say based on that, that if we have this type of chemical potential, then we will have this type of fluctuation spectrum? Like, can we say something about the okay, so the point is, if you keep, again, it's a, it's a chemical potential difference between reactants and products. Right, that right. Talking about. I meant the delta. Yeah, yeah, and that is a driving parameter. Certainly, in principle, changing that parameter, treating that driving as a control parameter, can take you from one phase to another. Mm -hmm. So if you find if you find a stationary state of the system, then if you look at what, what spatial symmetries are broken, you can use fairly general pres prescriptions to figure out the long wavelength dynamics of the systems. And as long as the noise, as long as you don't invoke very strange noises, you can figure out the spectrum. But merely stating that you have a given value of the driving doesn't immediately tell you the, the spectrum of the spectrum of fluctuations, it's still kind of the same thing as we do in equilibrium systems. If you know what kind of symmetries are broken, right. what kind of conservation laws are present, then you can work out on general grounds the fluctuations. Mm -hmm. All right. And then there is a question from Kinjal, and he's uh, asking, or he's saying, so ideally an experimental experimentalist should use the Harada-Sasa relation when doing rheology in an active matter system. So he's asking that. Are there ways to measure entropy production? Um, so um, you can, if you know the force on a coordinate and you know how the coordinate is moving, you can certainly measure the power dissipated. You, you, can, you can measure parts of the entropy production in, in these systems, certainly. Uh, whether you have access to all the degrees of freedom whose entropy is being produced is another matter. It right? was always going to be undetected degrees of freedom, but you can 
you can certainly measure pulses. For instance, you can measure, uh, yeah, so you can, you can measure quantities of that sort. You can certainly measure entropy production if you know uh, that. If, or in some cases, you could measure it perhaps by direct calorimetry or something like that. Again, if you have access to all the energy that's being dissipated. All right, and then there is a last question we will take for this tutor tutorial for now. And that was uh, from uh, Manasa. And uh, the question is, how does this change bulk forcing versus active matter where forces are local? Sorry, I don't understand exactly. If the question is, what is the difference between a system in which the energy is delivered directly to the particles and a system in which you've got a box of stuff and you shake the box. So then- Yes, so yes, I'm say, sorry, it was- uh, Okay, that's great, like I got, that means I understood exactly that. Okay, great. So the problem with systems where you shake the box and the particles in the interior get the energy indirectly is that uh, it's, there's no simple way of writing down the dynamics other than by introducing uh, a source at the boundaries and then monitoring the dynamics of that delivered energy. It could be interesting to look at that kind of case as we have not done that. The kind of simple-minded modeling that we wrote down here won't work. You will need to introduce an explicit uh, forcing variable, which depends on location. You need to understand the dynamics of energy delivery from boundary to interior. You could imagine this being a lot of interest in problems where the energy is not necessarily delivered by shaking, but you know, let us say by oxygen, okay? Uh, and those kinds of problems, you know, I think there are interesting analogs to inelastic collapse, uh, namely death, actually, which you could look at in these systems. So we haven't thought very much about it, but I think that's an interesting direction to look at. All right, okay, I will ask one final question before we move on to your other talk. So Robin uh, Brunsma is asking, is there a variational principle for active particles? Um, there's a variation principle only to the extent, so uh, let me put it this way. There is a prescription for deriving the equations of motion as uh, I showed uh, just now, but I don't know that there is a, a Fringy-like object that tells you in general what stationary states are preferred. There is some progress in the context of, so if you mean, if by variation principle you want to know an object that's minimized, versus something that gives you the equations of motion. I don't know which of the two you want to know. Yes. Which one? I asked. There was an uh, or. The first. <laughs> the first. Yeah. So in, for example, um, in just you know, scalar active matter, certainly people are beginning to understand uh, uh, what quantity is equalized between coexisting phases with various caveats on all of this. Okay. So yeah, in those contexts, uh, Julian Thayer, Mike Gates, many people uh, have been discussing. Or let me rephrase it. Could you formulate it as a path integral description for... So that you can, right? Because I just showed you the Langevin equations whose path yeah. of... Yeah, must be... The entire framework yeah. is absolutely available. Okay. Good. Thank you. Yeah. All right, Shriyam. We will wrap up this part and then we will move on to your research talk. Thanks again for a very, you know, very uh, exciting tutorial. So we will now Thank go you. on. Uh, now let me go to this talk. Okay, so now for something completely different. Um, polar, so this is about a talk with a fair amount of experiment in it, and it's in this biological physics uh, series because I wonder if there might be something that you could say about this in a truly biological context. So this is based on a paper that you can read uh, on the archive. Uh, experiments uh, in Ajay Sood's group, uh, with his student Roshan, uh, and theory and simulations by my student Rahul and uh, Hash Soni, who is currently a postdoc with us. So I'll introduce it, I'll tell you about the phenomenon, and I'll, uh, some theory, some experiments, and some simulations, and I'll summarize. Okay, so you know, clearly I'm interested in active matter, all kinds of scales, but the particular kind of active matter that's the subject of today's talk is artificial realizations of active matter, like this flock uh, of uh, pointy rods that organize themselves into an ordered state. I will not be talking about a flock, I'll be talking about uh, a rather different system. I'll be talking about a system 
uh, in which uh, one particular feature that should be quite generic in uh, active systems uh, shows up in a rather pretty way, which is non-reciprocal interactions. Imagine you had two spins in a magnet, and imagine that the exchange coupling that spin A felt due to spin B was different from the exchange coupling that spin B felt due to spin A. That clearly can't happen if the interaction comes from an energy function, but you can imagine that in a generic auto-equilibrium system, it could happen. We actually started worrying about this kind of thing uh, nearly two decades ago, and we're continuing to worry about it, and so are other people. Uh, this will emerge towards the end of the discussion, I'll tell you how. Okay? The motivation, however, wasn't to study non-reciprocal behavior. It is that, you know, you look, people have looked a great deal at the interaction of swimmers in a fluid. Um, motile objects in an elastic medium and how they influence each other has not been studied uh, as much. People have studied uh, actively contractile uh, force dipoles in an elastic medium. People have studied motile objects moving through an elastic medium. Uh, I'm, I'm just saying people, the names are up here. Uh, in this class, in the, in the uh, Saffron group work, the motile character was ignored. In Silke Henkes and others' work, the orientation variable was indeed a polar orientation and motility, but the particles didn't talk to each other through the medium. So the question is, what happens if you've got motile objects moving through an elastic Particles force the medium, the medium reorients the particle, and it turns out the dynamics is in a natural way, non reciprocal So we'll tell you about that. So now, um, if you go back to this story of a collection of polar rods moving through a medium of beads, which are dense but fluid-like, and they align each other by the movements that the rods create in the fluid, uh, that's what this picture is trying to illustrate. Here is, this is, Thing from a simulation. This is a polar rod moving through uh, a, a sea of beads. And we've tried to show here that if you color a few of the beads, as the polar rod moves, it drags the beads. If you increase the area fraction of the bead medium from 70% to 80%, then the polar rod goes through, but it really doesn't drag the beads with it. So now you've got a bunch of polar rods moving through a medium of beads, and they're not causing the bead medium to flow. Do they talk to each other? I just to highlight this here. In the fluid medium case, the, there's a flow field. In the crystalline medium case, there's basically some minor noise, but no flow. So how do polar guys moving through a crystalline medium talk to each other? OK. So I mean, for example, if you look at this guy, you can see it moving. And you can see that this medium here is crystalline. And as it moves, it's creating some kinds of disturbance in the medium. It's not exactly clear what happens. You almost get the impression that it's sort of moves, disturbs the medium, the disturbance is gone, and nothing happens. You can theorize first of all what might happen. You can say that I've got one polar particle, okay? Position R, orientation given by the unit vector N. You've got a bead medium in a crystalline state. Because it's in a crystalline state, I can declare that deviations about the crystalline state are described by a displacement field U. And if I pretend that that vibrated crystalline medium isn't very different from an equilibrium crystal if it weren't for this polar rod moving through it. So I'll say maybe it's governed by elastic free energy F. Okay, so then the dynamics of this bead medium, if I ignore inertia everywhere, is that uh, the friction on the beads due to the substrate on which they're sitting, which is some coefficient zeta, uh, balances the elastic restoring forces on the medium. If it weren't for this polar particle moving through it, that's all there would be. But because there is a polar particle moving through it, on any number of different grounds, you can argue that you are allowed to introduce a forcing on the bead medium in the direction of the orientation of the polar particle, situated at the location of the orientation of the polar particle, and with some coefficient f. You can think of that as just coming from a relative velocity of the uh, bead medium and the polar particle, but you know. Uh, it's an allowed term. So the polar rod moves, follows its nose, and moves at a speed V0, and it disturbs the medium. The next part of the story is that the orientation also has a dynamics. Now, if you have an orientable object in uh, a fluid, then the fluid carries it, uh, rotates it, and aligns it. 
Shuram, Theory for how? Yes. Yes. He's asking, is it force or force dipole? Uh, who asked this question first? Uh, Eric Dufresne. Yeah, it's a force because this whole system is sitting. I mean, the answer to the question is independent of who asked it. I just want to know. It's sitting on a solid substrate, and so I am absolutely entitled to introduce a force monopole because momentum balance is the you know I can balance my books because I've got a substrate which is a momentum sink. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, the orientational dynamics of this single rod is that it can couple in a polar manner to curvatures of the uh, of the crystal of the crystal planes in this case the crystal lines let's say to these two terms or it can couple to the strain right so if you strain a medium you can imagine it will produce a region in which the rod has a preferential orientation up to sine if you bend or splay the crystal planes if you like you want to think of it that way then you produce a vector the local force density or the local curvature which can align the rods. This guy comes in at sub leading order in radians. This guy is at leading order. This guy uh, will turn out not to matter, although we don't really understand why it doesn't play more of a role. Epsilon, epsilon here is the string. Okay, and so you can then ask, what's the dynamics? So what I'll do is I'll make my life really simple. I'll co-move with the particle. And I'll pretend there's no other particles right now. So then my du over d, del u over del t in the co-moving frame just becomes v0 dot uh, times d over dx. I'll assume, I'll say the particle moving in the x direction. So I get this and I get this. So now you can see that unlike in a fluid without inertia, when you put in a force, even if you put in a motile particle, um, the uh, leading far field behavior is uh, uh, something sort of, in, you know, let me put it this way. Yeah, unlike in a motile particle moving through a fluid, the rate of change term, here is the rate of change of the displacement, comes in at this order. Whereas if you had a motile particle moving through a fluid, the rate of change term would be an inertial effect. The rate of change of the displacement term is a damping effect, and it's there. And it took, so what that means is this active particle is a force monopole, but the displacement field you get is not the Green's function of the elastic medium. It's modified by the fact that the particle is moving in a very serious way. Dimensionally, you can see that this term, and comparing these two terms, you have a length scale, right? And what you get is a displacement field, which, which you know, if you have a copy of Darstein and Rishik in your room, you can actually calculate. Uh, and uh, it looks like this. Alpha and beta are non-dimensional uh, inverse correlation lengths built from the uh, two Lamé moduli. Uh, I've just forgotten to write down beta. It involves lambda plus mu or something. Okay, and similarly for the y component of the displacement field, it's not evident from this form, but it is evident to those of you who remember your uh, mathematics course that the decay of this object for right along the x-axis for positive x and negative x is very different. In front of the particle, the displacement field is strongly screened. It's exponentially screened. As even minus alpha x in fact. Behind the particle, it's not screened. It decays only as x to the minus a half. So this is really cool. You've got this particle moving along. It leaves a kind of overdamped elastic weight behind it, which particles behind it can sense. But it pretty much is like a stealth particle as far as what happens in front of it is concerned. Okay, that's one part. So now you can put in, you can look at the effects now. Uh, now imagine you have two particles. What I'll say is in a very simple-minded picture, predictably, this particle will feel the strain field of that particle, that particle will feel the strain field of this particle. They'll reorient either because of the strain mechanism or because of the curvature mechanism. And uh, you can, there's a little, you have to do a little bit of squinting at this to really see that you can imagine that it aligns, if it aligns all along the principal axis of the, of the extensional axis of the strain, then you will see that if I've got one particle and the other particle aligns like this, I'll end up getting attraction. So we, for the time being, we'll ignore the other way, it will be at the other term. Uh, and so we've made some predictions. We've made a prediction of the strain of the form of the displacement field. We've predicted what these two particles will do to each other. If you take the alignment along the extensional axis into account, 
two particles will approach each other, try to catch each other. Okay, so this is tested in uh, Ajay's lab uh, in this vibrating system. You shake stuff up and down. This is the sample cell. These are big particles, uh, half a centimeter length, about a millimeter in diameter, and there's beads which are about a millimeter in diameter. The rods are brass, the beads are aluminium. Uh, the rods shove the beads around. In this case, they just strain the lattice. And these guys kind of walk. What's happening really is you're tossing it up and down. And uh, when they come down, because one end is different from another, they end up walking in one direction. A sphere doesn't walk because you can't tilt a sphere. At least you won't know it's tilted. And uh, you can recreate this in a simulation that Hush, uh, Sony, and then uh, Rao Gupta have been doing and wrote and did. Um, you can build the polar particle. You can really slavishly model every detail of the experiment because you want to keep track of which microscopic feature is responsible for what behavior. And uh, you have a nice computer lab that reproduces the experiments. Uh, you can measure the strain fields. Measuring the strain fields is not as trivial as it sounds. You don't really want to measure the particle displacements. You want to back, you want to have a reference density wave without the polar particle in there and compare it to the density wave you get with the polar particle, assume they match far away and figure out the displacement field in the density wave picture. It took us a little time to wrap our heads around that. And when you do that, uh, you can measure the displacement fields. Theory predicts this strongly for off asymmetric displacement field. An experiment in this case, I guess, is simulation actually sees it. This is the X component. This is the Y component as a function of X. And so these general features are seen very nicely. Uh, we don't do at all well in reproducing the magnitudes of the Y component. Um, and the reason seems to have to do with the fact that we put in these fat particles and we haven't taken that into account in the theory at all. There's a large Y displacement, which is not taken into account. Nonetheless, um, you can actually, oh, I didn't, I'm sorry, I don't, the fits are there in the supplement to the uh, paper I've got in through me today. Um, you can fit and uh, do a reasonable job actually of fitting these forms. You can then look at what happens to particles at low area fractions where the medium is fluid, the particles actually slightly repel. And that's because, or when you have one particle moving along like this, it sets up a flow field like that. You put another one, it turns and goes away. You see that quite nicely in the experiments and the simulations. If you increase the area fraction, the particles attract. Uh, I'll show you movies in a few seconds. I think I've put them somewhere. I don't remember where. You see that quite nicely in the simulations as well. Uh, there is noise in the experiments. And so what you have is an enhanced probability of attraction and capture as you increase the area fraction of these. Okay. Um, and uh, so, you know, if you look at the experiments, for example, here are two rods, and you see they seek each other out and uh, pair up, and they stay paired. The experiment, the range over which you can do this experiment is the particles are big age, the experimental sample cell is about that big, so you don't have that much distance to work with. Um, if you look at this, no, this, if you look at low concentrations, you can see this is a simulation. They don't catch each other. If you now look in the theory predicts another feature. If you go back to the equations of motion, you will see that the way these particles talk to each other is kind of indirect, right? A given particle reorients the, another particle and that results in the particle moving in a certain direction. It's not that there is a, you know, SLB like elastic strain based interaction or anything like that. You've got two particles, you put them in, this guy reorients this guy and as a result they get, they, they meet up. Okay. So Shri, I have a question yes. from Meredith. So she's yeah. asking, I may have missed this, what is making the elongated particles move? So uh, if you, uh, sorry, where is it gone? Uh, yeah, in this experiment, uh, I, I kind of tried to indicate it here. So here you shake these guys up and the surface up and down. That's what's done in this experiment. It's shaken at a couple of hundred hertz and about 0.2 mm uh, amplitude. And that's the energy input. That's the nutrient path. You've got this particle, you toss it up. Imagine that the two ends of the particle are somehow mechanically different. One is fat, one is skinny. One is more friction, one is less friction. 
So what happens is you toss it up and it comes down. Uh, actually, I can say it the following way. You may remember from high school or uh, undergraduate physics that if you take a rod and place it vertically on a frictionless surface and you tilt it slightly and it falls, then its center of mass doesn't move, right? Because there's no friction. If there is static friction, if you toss the rod up and it comes down, it will fall and its central mass will displace. So that ultimately is the walking mechanism. Is that enough? Per perfect. Yes, I did miss it. So it's the it's the asymmetric it's the asymmetric shape. Asymmetry, the, yeah, asymmetry the, and static the, friction. The, the shaking and the friction. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Um, I seem to have gone too fast. This is okay. Um, yeah, I was going to explain about non-reciprocality. So because the interaction is non-mutual and because there is this weird stealth character of the interaction, if you've got two particles like this, as this particle moves along, this guy kind of doesn't know this one is coming because it's this placement field in front is very screened. On the other hand, remember they're both moving. This guy's moving, this guy's moving. As this guy comes along, the guy at the back can sense the elastic wake of the guy in front. The guy in front doesn't know about the guy at the back, or doesn't know much because of exponential speed. As a result, you expect a rather interesting kind of capture dynamics. The theory, if you take the Langevin equation for two particles in such a medium and just solve them numerically. So now we're not doing a numerical simulation of the particle mechanics. We're taking our equations of motion from the theory and solving them, you find this kind of characteristic catch up and uh, join up in this way. You see the same thing in the simulation, you see the same thing in the experiment. Essentially, what happens in the experiment, for instance, is like this. And uh, sure, indeed, the same thing happens uh, in the uh, uh, simulation. You know, it's, it's not significantly more dramatic. I should mention really that almost the first thing that Rahul Gupta pointed out when he started doing these studies, look, they always catch each other by sneaking up from behind. And it took me certainly ages to realize that that was the significant uh, observation. Um, and. Um, so that's what happens. I think I have, yeah, I think I said come to the end, I maybe I talked too fast. So I've convinced you that uh, elastic interactions of active pol polar particles are really a new, have really a new dimension in the motile particle uh, story. They're naturally non reciprocal You see them in this very simple recreation of motility using this vibrated surface. There's clear evidence, you know, the calculated displacement field the theory seems to agree very nicely with what's seen in the experiments. The uh, seems to predict what's seen in the experiments, and in the simulations at least, uh, you see clear evidence for non reciprocal capture. Um, just for fun, let's show you what happens when you have many particles. So, when you have a really large number of particles, you get rather dramatic combinations of flocking and uh, segregation of this sort which we are trying to understand now. That's the last part of uh, Raoul's thesis, um, but it's rather pretty. Um, it just strikes me that if you have motile objects, mo living motile objects moving through a layer of tissue or you know, fighting their way through the extracellular uh, matrix, uh, elastic interactions of the type that I have talked about, not of, you know, entirely due to their motility, uh, surely should arise somewhere. I have no idea if they really do, and I know in biology you're not supposed to talk about anything for which there isn't yet evidence. I have no idea if there is, but uh, this is my speculation. And with that, I end my talk, and we have to take more questions. Thank you, Shriram, for a wonderful yes. talk. There are already a lot of questions, so we are going to ask a subset of these questions in this q and in the next five minutes, and then we will have a more detailed a uh, 15 minute discussion based on both of your talks. So I will start with a question by Navish Vadva and David Lubensky and others had a very similar question. So Navish's question is, 
what assumptions go in this formulation when it comes to the relative size of the crystal particles in the motile object? So uh, we haven't put in excluded volume uh, between the particle, uh, you know, of the motile particle and uh, the medium. You know, if you just take a size mismatched object and stuff it into a crystal, you produce strains which could also give rise to clumping. That kind of thing has not gone in. So that's one important thing that's not gone in. Um, no other direct interactions between the motile particles, no pair potentials. Um, what else have we left out? Also, I should point out that there is the theory and there is the level of accuracy at which we solve the theory. Actually, two particles moving through a medium, uh, you need to solve the whole thing dynamically. Uh, we are working in a regime. This is important, actually. Uh, this gives me the opportunity for a small aside, which if you don't mind, I'll mention. You can imagine that you've got particles um, moving through a medium on time scales in which the medium is like is totally relaxed. Okay. Uh, the so let me just go back to the equations of motion and point out something. Um, Yeah, I guess this little one, yeah. So this quantity f, if you just look at uh, units here, you will find that this object suitably scaled is a kind of length. And the question therefore is whether the screening length is big or small compared to the length. You know, think about the following. Supposing you had, instead of this active matter problem, suppose you had a crystal with a dislocation in it, okay? then the Burgers vector comes in as a measure of the uh, jump in the displacement field when you uh, go around, and that's a length. Dimensionally, this term comes in in much the same place as uh, a dislocation uh, density would come in. So F defines the kind of length. Uh, the question is whether, <coughs> excuse me, um, have I done this correctly? Yes, I have. Yeah, so there's a question on whether a non-dimensional measure of self-propulsion, that is V0 moving along, you can compare V0 d over dx to mu del squared in some suitable way, at the length scale corresponding to F. And if that Peclet number is small, then the kinds of effects I'm talking about are not that important. And if the Peclet number is big, then the you know, motility aspect is important. That's just one thing that your question prompted to me it may not be exactly what you were asking. But to go back to what you said, if you look at these equations, you can see that interactions among the, the bead particles are only at the level of their elasticity. Interactions between the rods and the beads are only through forcing and reorientation. Uh, excluded volume in particular is missing. There's something more important, which is that we're also forgetting about the fact that we've got a polar vector in a crystalline medium I shouldn't really be writing down isotropic homogeneous elasticity. Just like when a dislocation moves through a crystal, it senses the actual spatial modulation of the structure. A polar particle moving through the medium has preferred directions in the crystal. Okay? That has also not been included. You see that in the experiments in the simulation. They like to move sort of between two rows or something like that. So, Yeah, I hope that was, I answered the question I wanted to answer. I hope it is related to what you asked. So I, Shriyam, I think I'm going to ask David Lewinsky's question, which yeah. is related to this. So he's saying this description looks like it rigorously requires a separation of scales between the moving particle and the crystal particles. Then have you thought about whether it is applicable to a crystal made of particles that are themselves motile? So that each motile crystal particle sees something like an effective elastic medium created by the other motile crystal particles. So actually there's two things. One is uh, that uh, the complete dynamics, even if the crystal, if the, beat, the particles of the crystal aren't themselves motile, um, even that dynamics actually has competing time scales. And we've sort of, you know, done that at a very simple level where we've not worried about, you know, We've not, we, it's like when you do um, uh, hydrodynamic interaction between particles, you, do, you don't you do multiple reflections. We've sort of 
taken as simple a picture as possible, each particle reorienting in the field produced by the other. That even that dynamics has to be done uh, more carefully and when there are many particles, it's very complicated. I'm not sure how to do it theoretically. In addition, if the crystal particles are motile, uh, you can imagine redoing this. There is already a fairly reasonable description of uh, motile monolayer, crystalline monolayers. Uh, uh, people have done this kind of thing in a phase free crystal language. We have done it uh, with an new and elastic theory, uh, active version of elastic theory language, and got the rotation invariances right and so forth. So uh, I think that kind of thing can be done here. We've not done it for this particular system. All right. So I think we will wrap up the Q&A, like this kind of Q&A now, and then we are going to go to, I will keep asking you questions because there are a lot of questions, but now we are, we are moving on to the next 15 minute mark. So the first question is from Ricard Alert, and he's saying, I see that the medium affects the orientation of the active particles. Can it, can it affect particle speed as well? Uh, I'm sure it can, we have not worried about that. Uh, in principle, it, it could. The medium, you know, it's a nice, clean crystalline layer. So it, uh, at, the, at the present level of description, because the medium isn't wildly homogeneous, its speed doesn't get affected. But yes, I'm, you know, once you have many rods, for instance, in there, many things will happen. We have indeed taken the, um, so in other words, let's put it this way. That question amounts to saying, shouldn't I have other terms in the equation R dot equals V dot N of T coming from the medium? And indeed, in principle, it should. Mm -hmm. All right, so the next question is from Suraj Shankar and he's, uh, he's asking, can you have a coupling of the orientation to the asymmetric part of the strain? Um, so I think not. We actually panicked about this for a while because what it says is, you know, the antisymmetric part of the velocity gradient is a steady rotation and that will rotate the orientation. Merely having an antisymmetric part to the gradient of the displacement would mean I take the system and choose to view it in a different coordinate system. I don't go, you know, I just statically rotate the system and put it down. And that should somehow cause a rate of reorientation of the vector n. I think it won't happen. So the next question is from Dev Shankar Banerjee, and he asks, uh, the deformation in the granular media are non-affine, is it not? If we assume it to be affine, does that make any difference in the theoretical description? Yeah, so we have actually, you're absolutely right that we have uh, not really worried about non affineness You can see all kinds of non affine stuff happening locally. We kind of assume it heals and only the far field is participating. But uh, in principle, more could happen. In principle, more could happen if you have more particles. Um, it's an interesting question, and I don't know. All right, then Kinjal Das Viswas asks Can the theory be extended to a situation where the forcing is dipolar instead of monopolar? like uh, for eukaryotic cells in three-dimensional gels where there is no momentum saving. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that, uh, that can indeed be done. Um, at some level, so the point is to look at force dipoles, but with uh, a polarity as well, so the particles are moving. Um, we've done some of that, but I have, I have half a feeling that the equations exist in some form somewhere. I'm not absolutely sure. It, I, I mean, we've been working on that also, um, uh, but have done so more in a context of uh, getting the elastic, th getting the collective dynamics of uh, active polar crystals right. Um, but yeah, it can. And it will still give non-reciprocal interactions like you saw in your case. <clears throat> um, my guess is it will, just because if you've got strains reorienting the orientation, you should get this. But the, the, long, the, intra, the nature of the interactions will be different, mm -hmm. because the, uh, the momentum equation now, uh, 
will be important. Equivalently, the damping in the displacement equation won't be zeta del u over del t, it will be something times the Laplacian of del u over del t. Okay. Because of uh, momentum conservation. Mm -hmm. Then we have a question from Navish Vadva again, and he's asking, perhaps this is a naive question, is the shaking induced motion the same as what would be due to an external field on a particle with some added randomness? So it's, it is like an external field, but it's an adapted external field. It's pointing in the direction of the particle's nose. So if you just took an external field and said, go that way, that's different because these particles move in the direction of their orientation. So in that sense, it's different. Okay. And then Eric Dufresne is asking a question, uh, which is how can you differentiate a non-reciprocal interaction from an anisotropic mobility? Um, well, I think they're very different. And I, I, well, guess... I, mean, I mean, from an experiment, sorry, like how do I know so when I, particles yeah, behave I guess... that it's non-reciprocal, not theoretically? Yeah, yeah, so I think the point is, that's why we deliberately chose this effect of two particles orthogonal to each other, but the directions in which they point with respect to the crystal aren't in any physical way very different, right? You look at this, this last slide. Um, um, so this guy is pointing that way, this guy is pointing that way. The medium is much the same in those two directions. The only difference is uh, what they do to each other. So it's not, uh, it's not because of a difference between longitudinal and transverse uh, mobility of the particle. Because each is being driven by its drive, its own driving force, essentially in the direction of its nose. But one is going on a lattice plane and the other one is not. Yeah, that issue could be there. Okay. Um, but that, you know, you could probably mess with initial conditions and make sure they're even sitting in very similar grooves or something. So I don't think it's the lattice plane that's doing it. They're both kind of pushing a row of particles and moving along, more or less. Not sure, but I mean, that's at least to a parent's loving eye, it looks that way. So I think there is a question that goes well with this, uh, a comment or a question from uh, Manasa Kandula again. And the uh, thing is, is it correct that regardless of the initial separation distance, the polar particles are always going to come together because of the uh, no, no. Sorry, I, I, maybe I didn't have a slide on that, sorry. Thing is that certainly in the experiment, because there's noise, they can lose their way. They may then, you know, especially because it's two dimensions, they may end up finding each other by chance. And if they happen during that second encounter, they happen to be in the, in the propitious uh, one ahead, one kind, both moving, uh, situation they're very likely captured but if they're far apart basically noise can certainly make them lose their way and it does mm -hmm. okay then there was a question from rudra biswas and he's asking what is the source of the elasticity the medium looks like its deformations are plastic in the, in the certainly the way a given in the immediate vicinity of the motile polar particle irreversible non-affine plastic things are happening Nonetheless, the far field is measurably just an elastic field. You can ask why this system has elasticity. The honest answer is I don't know. Imagine you had instead a thermal hard sphere gas. There you know the elasticity comes from the entropy, from the fact that a distorted configurator, a, macro, a macroscopic, micro, there are fewer microstates consistent with a distorted macroscopic configuration than with an undistorted one. And that's where the elasticity comes in. And its scale is set by the actual thermodynamic temperature. These guys are kind of like thermal hot spheres, but you know, they really aren't, right? Because you're tossing them up and down. And uh, they, you know, it's not like kinetic energy by any means. It's really, in any case, you don't need, uh, as with any hard particle system, what's really meaningful is not the elastic constants. The elastic constants scale by the energy. And Roughly speaking, it looks like when you have a monolayer of spherical particles that you vibrate it, they sample their configuration space in a manner similar to a hard sphere Monte Carlo at that area fraction. And to that extent, with not 100% faithful, to that extent, they have elasticity probably for the same reason as uh, 
an actual retail balance respecting R-square Monte Carlo. It would be fun to check the configuration space dynamics of a vibrated uh, monodispersed hard sphere layer and see the degree to which it's just like the equilibrium MC. I don't know. Megesh mm -hmm. Rudra commented that in the far field, the displacements are small enough to be in the elastic regime. Yeah, yeah. Okay, then there's a question from Pencil Wynn, and she's asking if the background medium was vis viscoelastic instead of being elastic. Can you use this formulation with small changes for that kind of a situation? I guess one could. Um, I mean, you know, if it, we haven't thought about the case where it's a viscoelastic fluid, but supposing it's, uh, you know, I, I'm asking about a system which on long time scales, on low frequencies is actually fluid like, but has elasticity on intermediate time scales. I think I. So I guess I will speak for her. She's my PhD mm -hmm. student, so I guess I, I, I have okay. some idea she's, where she's coming from. I think she's basically asking about your framework. So if you're- Yeah, yeah but uh, there, we can imagine two different versions of this question. You could right. imagine doing this kind of thing for more complex media like this plastic media. Right. Uh, to the extent that this orientational dynamics uh, takes place, this kind of framework can be used. Right. Or suitably- And, and you are asking with, you know, whether the question is like, Small, what time scales, right? Like intermediate time. Yeah, scales. meaning that meaning is the medium ultimately fluid like or ultimately crystal like would make a difference. I think more, maybe ultimately crystal like. Yeah, so then, then you know, on the long time, the large scale dynamics will probably be similar. Mm -hmm. All right, we still have some time left. So if you guys have more questions, you can unmute yourselves and ask questions. Uh, meanwhile, I wanted to thank Shriram again for you know a wonderful pair of talks and thanks, i am really, very really much. honored to host you today those of you who do not know this Shram is my phd advisor and i am i am really thrilled to host him today we well, all I mean, are. i'm delighted to talk and honored to talk when you're organizing thank you so if there are more questions i guess please rudra is asking could you Please riff a little more on the variational principle for the formulation of the active matter. Yeah, that's that's a really great question, actually. Um, okay, let me go back to that and uh, find the other talk. Well, I mean, the point is, if someone gives you a Lorentz equation governed by a white noise, then you know that you know. So, I mean, if, you know, pick any of these equations. Pick this one. You know that the basically you look at the path probability of the noise, and because the equation relates the noise directly to this dynamics, what you have is that the path probability of the noise can be rewritten. Re as e to the minus sort of the equation of motion, a quadratic form involving the deterministic part of the equation of motion with a kernel, which is the noise covariance, right? Well, the, the inverse of the noise covariance. So uh, once you have an object of this form, you can do whatever you can do in uh, field theories. You can, of course, take this object and kind of uncomplete the square by introducing uh, by you know this object being like a Gaussian in the, this combination of equation of motion variables can be rewritten instead in terms of its functional Fourier transform which is known as introducing the MSR field and you can work with that and you can you know much of the machinery of uh, functional integrals and whatever you can do when you have an action is available to you. So um, uh, I don't have the slides on hand to show you the kinds of things you can do, but there are these great lectures by uh, uh, called six out of equilibrium lectures or something like that, uh, which will give you an idea of the kinds of things you can do with such, uh, with an action. So if that is what you're asking. 
Yes. So Eric, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question directly? Yeah, oh, yeah sure, that's fine. Thank you. Um, yeah, Sriram, as an experimentalist, I want to know what I can measure to know if my system is non-reciprocal in sort of a generic sense. And maybe the idea is maybe if there were an ensemble of objects interacting with each other, <laughs> and I could measure all of their trajectories over a time. Is there like a statistical test I could do so I could say confidently that the interactions are non-reciprocal or not in equilibrium, out of equilibrium, whatever situation you want to propose? Yeah, so I would say the point is partly, quite honestly, in a generic sense, non-reciprocal becomes slightly a marketing word. The sense in which I would take it really seriously is if the um, zero frequency part of the response of one position-like variable to another position, you know, one coordinate-like variable to another coordinate-like variable uh, was non-mutual. So if you, so let's take a different system. Supposing you take what uh, Vincenzo Vitelli calls odd elasticity. So I don't know if you know uh, that work, but those are cases where you can ask about the relation between a stress and a strain. Uh, and not with a dynamical lag, but at the same level as elastic theory. If you find that the static relation between stress and strain uh, is non-symmetric, that's an example of non-reciprocality, which you can say is kind of intrinsic. In general, when you have these mediated interactions, like in the present system, um, I'd have to work a little bit to come up with a quantitative measure. I will, I will take this as a homework problem to think up a kind of an objective uh, measure of non-reciprocality in the system as a whole. I don't have a short answer for this case. I, it's unsatisfactory, I know. But. No, yeah, yeah, anyway, I look forward to it, yeah. And, and Shriram, uh, Shri had a backup uh, follow-up to this question, which is that, is your answer different from living active matter and non-living active matter? I mean, living but not very clever active matter should do the same as this, right? The problem is if, the point is, you know, in the kind of examples I was speculatively saying this might apply to, uh, like, uh, you know, cell, like Jason run dynamics in, in uh, tissue or something. The point is there are so many other kinds of signals there other than elastic, that all I can really say is that reorientation torques coming from elasticity should in principle be one of the contributing factors, but you know, there's contact inhibition, there is some other chemical sensing, there's so many things, right? So then one can't be sure. So I think those would be the differences. Great, thank you. And then Senthil, if you're here, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Uh, he says, doesn't have a mic handy, you should go okay. ahead. And I, I will read Senthil's question. So there, this question is from Senthil uh, Arumugan. And oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 sorry, I, I butchered your name. I no, know. no, I know him. So, <laughs> I, I, asking, is there a re-emergence of disturbances few beads behind when the particle traverses? Would that account for the orientation changes in the catch-up observed in the two-particle system? One of your first movies seemed to display such a behavior. Okay, so let me go to that talk. So the question is whether the catch-up is happening for the reasons that we claimed it's happening. Uh, so you do see, let me just go to the end here. Yeah, so the point is when the particle is, you know, get, gets close enough to the particle in front, you can see that there's all kinds of, I mean, there's, you know, maybe the melting of the medium or something is, is involved. I don't know that. Uh, so we, I guess it would be important to measure correlations between the extensional part of the strain and the particle orientation to be absolutely sure of the mechanism we advertise is really happening. 